ladies and gentlemen, it seems that we have lost our moderator. <laughs> okay, then let me take over. Uh, maybe here, here arrives a bit later. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, announce the next section uh, on agenda issues, uh, very important things. And um, I would like to introduce to you the first speaker, which is um, my uh, colleague, Riri Kashab. Uh, she's a professorial fellow and associate professor of social demography, is co-leader of the program on dig digital and computational uh, science at the Leverholm Center for Demographic Science at the University of Oxford. Riri, the floor is yours. Great, thanks very much, Andreas. I um, can you confirm that you can see my uh, screen or my slides? Yes. yes, works properly. Excellent, and you can hear me as well. Yep, great, perfectly well. Thank you. Excellent. Um, great, thank you very much, Andreas, uh, for inviting me, and also to the team at Population Europe for inviting me to speak um, at this panel and at this very exciting event. Uh, the Global Demography Forum. I've really enjoyed listening in on the presentations today um, and I'm very uh, excited to be able to talk uh, today a bit about my research but also what I see as a very interesting question moving forward about the digital revolution and its implication and its implications for gender equality and uh, women's empowerment especially in the context of low and middle income countries. So before I go uh, further let me start off by asking, and I've said, what is this, or let me start off by asking uh, and describing what is the digital revolution. So what I mean by the digital revolution is essentially what's shown on this graph here on, your, on the slide, which is, uh, this is data from the ITU, and it's really the tremendous diffusion of internet and mobile technologies that has occurred, uh, especially mobile technologies uh, starting the late 1990s and internet technologies uh, and mobile internet starting sort of uh, the mid 2000s really taking off in 2010 and what we see here is technology subscriptions per capita we see landline technologies really sort of stagnating and we see this big boom in mobile uh, also fixed internet and mobile internet as i said really taking off and this is the digital revolution that i'm going to talk about today and i want to think critically about this digital revolution in terms of its implications for social impacts, especially surrounding issues linked to gender, but also think about the potential it holds in the context of uh, it being potentially a measurement revolution. So here's just to reinforce that this digital revolution is a technological revolution that is really a global. So these are, of course, levels of technology subscriptions per capita are different across different parts of the world. So we see, for example, there's definitely much more room to grow still in Africa and in Asia uh, relative to Europe and North and South America. But at the same time, what we do see is clearly that the growth in technology proliferation is really uh, everywhere across all regions of the world. And in some places, notably here Africa and also in Asia, we see that the landline stage of telecommunication development has really been skipped altogether. And it's really just, it's all mobile. Uh, where the growth is taking place. So that's the digital revolution. And the digital revolution is clearly a technological revolution in terms of information and communication technologies. But I want to argue today that the digital revolution is also and can be thought of also um, as a social revolution um, in that it's shaping how we access information and vital services, how we communicate with each other and potentially expand our networks. and the importance of digital infrastructures has really been underscored by COVID, uh, where we're all working from home, where we really are relying on digital connectivity to get things done, um, including sometimes accessing uh, vital services such as goods from the supermarket, if, for example, uh, you've had to self-isolate as I have to. <laughs> so by lowering costs of information and connectivity, we can think of the digital revolution as potentially having uh, the capacity to empower marginalized populations, particularly those who otherwise have faced greater barriers to accessing information and connectivities, um, and also potentially facilitate the attainment of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the kind of global roadmap to guide international development policy. 
Um, so the digital revolution and the idea of the digital revolution as a social revolution is also underpinned in a number of the SDG indicators uh, where we see sort of themes of the importance of technology uh, cutting through. And we also see that as I'll talk about in the next slide in SDG five on gender equality and women's empowerment specifically. However, the increasing adoption of internet and mobile technologies, I also want to argue today is ushering in a data revolution in that it's the, the fact that we use the internet and mobile phones um, and the fact that there are other kinds of technologies around is generating new streams of data that uh, have the potential to create new streams and expand the potential of traditional data sources and provide complements uh, to fill uh, some of these data gaps. So the work that I'm gonna talk about today is, is work that I've done uh, myself in collaboration with colleagues in Oxford, as well as at other institutions where in our, uh, in our work, we've really sort of explored the, the ways in which the digital revolution is both a social revolution and um, a data revolution. And as I said, specifically, the topic of my talk uh, in this panel on gender is to think a bit more concretely about the digital revolution in the context of SDG5. And first, I'm gonna present some work where we've looked at the role and the diffusion of mobile phones particularly um, and look at their impacts on women's empowerment and sexual and reproductive health indicators and outcomes. And here I'm going to marshal two types of data sources uh, to, to describe some of these relationships between technology and uh, these social development outcomes. First is just to sort of take a bird's eye global macro level view by looking at countries over time and sort of look at these associations uh, where technology proliferation and how it's associated with changes in these outcomes, uh, these development, social development outcomes. Um, and then I'm going to look at uh, some individual level survey data, which is then uh, augmented by connecting it with, uh, with satellite uh, remotely sensed data and to see to what extent we can look at the individual level of how ownership of mobile phones, particularly in, in the hands of women, uh, have implications for health and well-being um, outcomes. And in the latter part of my presentation, I'll talk a bit more about the digital revolution as a data revolution and talk about some of the work that I've done uh, with other colleagues, uh, particularly those uh, from more computer science backgrounds and looking at how we can leverage social media advertising data to track global digital gender gaps uh, specifically. So I want to start off by looking at mobile phones and their impacts through uh, the lens of global macro level evidence. And here what we've done, this is joint work with my colleagues in Oxford, Valentina Rotondi, uh, as well as at Bocconi University, Simona Spinelli, Francesco Villari, and Luca Pisano, who's at McGill University. And what we have done here in, in the work that I'm just gonna present in the next few slides is we assembled this data set of essentially countries over time, over 200 countries from 1993 to 2017, assembling indicators from the UN, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, World Bank, and UNDP. Essentially, we build this cross-national country level data set to look at um, how uh, mobile technologies, as well as a range of other outcomes, we also have information on changing educational composition and GDP and so on in our data set. And we want to see how is mobile phone diffusion associated with these different outcomes such as the gender inequality index, contraceptive prevalence, maternal mortality, and under five mortality. And we do we sort of estimate a range of models. Um, and what I wanna show you here is a sort of a simple picture really, is to see that across all these different outcomes and a net of a number of other controls for educational expansion, um, as well as uh, economic development uh, as measured by GDP, we, we find that there are very robust correlations and, and these correlations are also robust to models such as panel data fixed effects, also robust to, uh, we also try some IV and some difference in different specifications, but essentially we see a strong and consistent effect for mobile diffusion uh, on each of these four outcomes. So here we have gender inequality index, uh, contraceptive prevalence, um, and in the next slide, we have the two mortality indicators, maternal mortality and under five mortality. And across these different models, we see essentially that the diffusion of mobile phones is strongly correlated with these outcomes, these development outcomes. And we find that these 
uh, associations are stronger in GDP quintiles one and two. So essentially poorer countries are where we see stronger effects for mobile phone diffusion on the social development um, outcomes linked to here contraceptive prevalence and gender inequality. And as I said, so these are also uh, when we just do uh, country fixed effects and we just look at changes over time, we also see uh, that in these kinds of models, we also see effects for mobile technology holding through. We also see that once we put in controls for educational change and other kinds of social changes that are taking place at the macro level, we see that mobile technologies are, they seem to be positively, the diffusion of mobile technologies is positively associated with these um, social development outcomes. So this is at the macro level where we assemble and we look at countries over time. Uh, so the unit of analysis here is a country and countries observed uh, over time. Looking at a different set of data for uh, complementary evidence here, now we look at uh, and we use data from the demographic and health surveys and it really is exciting to be on the same panel uh, with Dr. Sunita Kishore because we use the demographic and health surveys here, which in, more, in the uh, starting phase seven of the DHS have started collecting information on the use of uh, mobile phones or access to mobile phones, uh, which I think are really key uh, uh, questions to include in the survey um, and have really helped the kind of work that I'm going to present here, where the DHS um, not only has now these technology indicators in there so that we know, you know which women uh, and where women have access to mobile phones, um, but we also have the wealth of data that is already in the DHS uh, on topics such as sexual and reproductive health and well-being, on women's empowerment, and of course, range of other uh, measures linked to uh, fertility. So we have in the D with the DHS, uh, we use the question specifically in the women's module on uh, mobile uh, ownership. And we have here, we're going to look specifically at sub saharan where we, at the, the time we did this analysis, we had the technology indicators or technology use indicators available. Um, and we take the fact that the DHS now has uh, also provides uh, lat long, so it provides geographical coordinates uh, for the DHS clusters. Uh, so we sort of know the geographical location of where people live, which is really powerful because then it allows us also to merge this with other geographical data sets. So here, what we do is we merge uh, this geographical information. And we link the DHS also to grid climatology data sets, which give us uh, information uh, observed via satellites of lightning strikes. So then you ask, why are we interested in lightning strikes? Well, in the social sciences, often we can't do lab experiments. So as a result, we have to rely on kind of natural experiments such as lightning strikes. Because in places where lightning strikes tend to happen more, we see slower adoption of mobile phones and poorer connectivity, which kind of creates a natural experiment for us to overcome some of the potential biases that we might have when analyzing the effects of mobile phones on these uh, outcomes of women's empowerment. For example, we could have reverse causality where actually it's more uh, empowered women who are the ones who are owning mobile phones in the first place. So the direction of the effect goes the other way rather than from mobile phones to empowerment. So to sort of overcome some of these kinds of issues, we leverage this natural experiment, which is facilitated by the fact that we can link the DHS, which has uh, got the geographical information in it with the gridded climatology data set, which gives us satellite data on uh, information on lightning strikes, which are observed from space. Um, we also have information on nighttime imagery and we and there's work that's shown that night lights are a really good proxy for economic development. So it gives us very localized measures of development so we can sort of control for other developmental processes that are unfolding at a very micro level on the ground uh, in our analysis. So this is just to sort of show you that in Southern Africa here in the seven countries that we have, when we look at mobile phone ownership among women, we see actually significant heterogeneity. We see, for example, in Burundi here, we have 27% reporting ownership, whereas in Zimbabwe, we have 72%, but there's a lot of room, there's variation, but there's also the here, what these figures suggest is there's also room for more technology diffusion to happen um, as well, right? So this is not a process that is in any way complete um, looking at the the figure here. 
So essentially, when we do this analysis, when we use the DHS, which has been augmented with these uh, climatology uh, and other data sets, um, we find in our analysis some striking results. We find that women with mobile phone access uh, across these seven countries um, are those that have greater decision-making power when it comes to their decision-making around contraception, around who they visit, whether they can visit uh, family and friends, their health, um, as well as they're also more likely to use contraception. Um, they're also more likely to be aware of where to get tested for HIV and they're also more likely to use antenatal care. So in a sense, we see women who have mobile phones or owning mobile phones are the ones who are actually more, who have uh, positive outcomes when it comes to being better informed about their health and their well-being and are also more empowered to make their own decisions surrounding their health and well-being. We also, when we dig deeper into these data, we find something, again, kind of paralleling what I was showing you at the macro level, where we found that the more powerful effects uh, at the macro level of mobile diffusion were in sort of poorer countries. So those in Q Q1 and Q2, uh, quintile one and quintile, quintile two of GDP per capita. In a sort of parallel way, we find that the most, uh, the biggest payoffs of mobile uh, access, mobile phone ownership, and these outcomes really appears to be in these areas where there is lower levels of local development. So effectively the payoffs of mobile technology are higher where there is potentially other infrastructure that is lacking. So these are here in these contexts in these seven countries, these low levels of local development are essentially sort of the, the most remote or poorer uh, micro clusters. Where as a result, we might expect that the access to mobile phones may bolster some of these outcomes, which otherwise uh, might be difficult to attain uh, given the lack of other infrastructure. So just to summarize what I've talked about so far, mobile phone ownership here is clearly linked to women's empowerment, as I've shown in these analyses, uh, and to outcomes linked to reproductive and sexual rights and, um, and well-being. Um, and we see these bigger payoffs at lower levels of development. So effectively, especially the analysis from the DHS seems to suggest putting mobile phones in the hands of women has significant social uh, impacts. However, an implication of that, of course, is that, well, we need to then better understand patterns of digital connectivity and digital access by gender in particular. So this leads me to the second part of work that I've been doing, the second stream of work in which I've been very interested in understanding some of these patterns of digital access by gender. Um, and actually in starting out this work initially, I found that there was actually something of a data gap when it came to measuring and analyzing uh, gender gaps in mobile ownership. When we looked at the various kinds of sort of traditional data sources uh, that social scientists such as myself tend to use, which are surveys or, or censuses. So censuses have great data on household ownerships of assets, but we don't often know whether men or women within households have uh, access to these assets and how differential patterns of use by gender really operate within the household. On the other hand, in the surveys, we might have access, but some of these gender disaggregated measures aren't widely available from surveys in many parts of the world. So for example, on this map, which is from uh, our project website, digitalgendergaps.org, we see that in many parts of Africa, uh, as well as in parts of South and West Asia, we don't have good indicators of gender gaps computed here as a female to male ratio and mobile ownership uh, available via surveys. Similarly, we see a gap in the gender gap in internet access. When we try and compute this using standard available surveys, we see big data, big data gaps in Africa and in South Asia for this indicator as well, if we just do a sweep across available standard social science survey instruments. So one thing that we've been exploring as a part of the work that we've done in this digital gender gaps uh, project is to see to what extent can be used novel data sources looking at social media populations. So we know that platforms such as Facebook and Google have large user populations, large user bases that are global across the world. So can we use information that these platforms provide to potential advertisers uh, 
to uh, who want to launch ads on these platforms. So they give them estimates of audience sizes. Can we leverage those data sources and repurpose them to track global digital gender inequality? And that's what we've been doing as a part of the Digital Gender Gaps Project, where here we see gender gaps in internet use. Again, a female to male ratio. So one would indicate gender parity, whereas anything less than one indicates a gender gap disfavoring women. We see gender gaps in internet use predicted using what I call the Facebook gender gap index, which is simply the female to male ratio of Facebook users. Um, and we find that that indicator is highly correlated with available survey data on uh, internet use and mobile use across the world, mobile use gender gaps and internet use gender gaps across the world. And as a result, they can help expand timely coverage of internet and mobile access gender gaps and give us a, a view to where these gaps are larger and do it regularly. So for example, looking at this map, we see that there are significant gender gaps disfavoring women in internet and mobile access in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in, um, in South Asia. And this is just to give you a sense of what the Facebook advertising platform looks like. Uh, here I've simply queried in Nigeria, 18 plus, how many men? our Facebook users, monthly active users, and we get 11 million. Similarly, we could get a similar figure for women and the female to male ratio is what is the underlying data to compute the female, uh, the Facebook uh, gender gap index. Similarly here, we can do the same with Google AdWords, uh, which is Google's advertising platform, which doesn't give us an estimate of users. It gives us an estimate of impressions, but it still tells us something about the digital footprint of the global online population. In this case, we're interested in who's not online. Here I'm analyzing gender gaps. So the fact that women are not online on these populations is a sign that on Google or on Facebook, especially in contexts where these gender gaps are larger, is a really good signal that they're not online altogether. So this is just how we compute these indicators. Facebook gender gap index, AdWord gender gap index, this is coming from Google, simply the female to male gender ratio of users on the platform divided by the female to male gender ratio of the population as a whole, because we're interested in, in digital gender inequality, not uh, imbalances, demographic imbalances in the population um, specifically. And this is just to show what I was uh, talking about. We get essentially here's the AdWord gender gap index and the Facebook gender gap index. Here they're highly correlated with one another. Uh, so essentially they're two large online platforms. Those who have Facebook accounts also then they have Google accounts, but they're not perfectly correlated with one another. And we see again, large, uh, we see essentially women are significantly underrepresented in both the Facebook and Google population in Africa, uh, in South Asia. Um, and in East, uh, in, in South Asia and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and we see greater gender equality uh, or the gender gap is largely closed in the populations um, of Europe, uh, North America, and also Latin America and the Caribbean, but there's also a lot of heterogeneity uh, between uh, countries in these regions. So just to summarize what I've talked about, first I've tried to show that the digital revolution is a clearly a social revolution where there is potential to make an impact, especially in the lives of women when mobile phones, as I showed, are placed in the hands of women, they have the role, uh, they have the potential to make significant impacts. However, we also see that there are significant gender gaps in digital access, particularly in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So one way to interpret that is clearly mobile phones have a role to play, but that potential of technology cannot really be realized. The positive social impacts of technology cannot really be realized if these digital gender divides persist. Conversely, we can think that if there's greater digitalization and a lot of access to key services is going to rely on digital infrastructures, and if women remain excluded from these digital infrastructures and digital technologies, essentially we're going to reinforce and potentially widen inequalities. So we have to keep in mind and closely measure and monitor digital gender gaps and understand where they are and how they're evolving. I've also tried to show that the digital revolution is a data revolution, which is creating new kinds of data opportunities. We talked about social media data, but also we can bolster, for example, the DHS by connecting it with remotely sent satellite data. They give us powerful tools for social science in a digital age. However, these complementary data, so we 
I like to think of these new data sources as complementary data sources. They're good complements, but in no way substitutes for high quality surveys, censuses, and qualitative data, which also together inform our understanding of gender and other vital social processes. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and I look forward to the questions uh, after Dr. Kishore's presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kashyap. Um, I'm Michael Herman. I think we met in the earlier session today already. I, you posed a question in the Q&A. Um, Andreas already announced me. I'm moderating this session as well. Uh, sorry to everyone for stepping in a bit late as I was held back by another meeting. But I got the largest share of your presentation. I'm very happy about that. So we'll have a conversation about that in just a minute. But as you're saying, our next presenter in this session is Dr. Sunita Kishore, the director of the DHS program. Her presentation is entitled Understanding Gender and its Role Using DHS Data. Understanding Gender and its Role Using DHS Data. Dr. Kishore. If I could give you the floor, please. Thank you very much. We see your presentation. It's okay, not a full slide, but we don't hear you yet. Yeah, now I okay. hear you as well. If All right. Make it full screen, that would be- Yes, I'm-, I'm, I'm... Right, thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you, Riddhi, for a good segue into my presentation. Um, I am, uh, as, as introduced, I'm the director of the DHS and in my presentation today, I will address how the DHS program is helping to better measure and understand the role of gender in low and middle income countries. Um, I had, by the way, a few comments on a lot of the mobile technology use, um, but we'll reserve those for the question and answer session. In my presentation, I am going to first introduce the DHS program with a lot of apologies to those who already know about it. And then I will discuss what, D what data DHS provides on gender, followed by some illustrative gender research pieces done by DHS staff over the years. And finally, I want to discuss some data gaps and share some thoughts about the current status of measurement and understanding of gender, in particular, women's empowerment. Dr. Kishore, excuse yes. me just for, for one second. That sounds fantastic. We're looking forward to it. We have a question here in the chat whether it's possible for you to turn on your video so the audience can see. Yeah, do you mind? No, here it is. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thanks. All right, so. But first I want to start with a quiz. This is in, you know, trying to introduce the DHS to you. Um, what do you think these numbers are? Now I know you can't answer me, but I hope you guess that the number in purple is the number of households completed in DHS surveys since program initiation. Now, unlike a lot of the mobile phone type surveys, these are all face-to-face -face surveys um, over the years. And the second number in red is the number of biomarker tests completed in 2020. Biomarkers make it essential that we actually have face-to-face -face surveys. And what do you think this is? These are the 75,000 or so DHS clusters where households have been interviewed since we started collecting GPS data. And finally, this number. This is the number of DHS data sets downloaded in the last year. So the question really is, what is the DHS and what is its purpose? Everybody, a lot of people know it as a survey, but the DHS program, which has been funded by USAID since 1984, provides technical assistance to low and middle income countries, to not just help them collect demographic data, 
demographic health and nutrition data, but also to disseminate, analyze, and use it. And this is important because one of the key guiding forces of trying to you know, spread the analysis and the use of data is to try and increase gender balance in analytical skills and uh, exploiting the data to improve gender um, relations and, and address gender issues. This is a map of all the surveys we've done over the years, of more than 400 surveys in more than 90 countries. Now, it's important to remember, and, and you know, these are some of the constraints that in the end um, are sort of, we are subject to, uh, that not only is the objective to provide high quality data that is comparable across countries and over time, we have to do this with host country ownership and building capacity. This constraint of, provi of providing comparable data puts a singular constraint on questionnaire content. Most content must be relevant of almost as is across countries. Now this does not mean of course, that there is no country specific adjustments. It just means that comparability remains a guiding principle for key content. The DHS survey, um, it essentially has five household question, five questionnaires. This is the household survey. We also do some service provision assessments. The core questionnaires are the starting point for DHS surveys. These core questionnaires, countries can add optional DHS modules or their own questions. Core questionnaires are revised every five years with input from stakeholders worldwide. Having a core questionnaire allows the analysis of trends as well as cross-country comparisons. Um, in the DHS, both women and men are asked questions on topics such as contraceptive use, marriage, sexual behavior, gender attitudes, and other empowerment variables. The DHS man's questionnaire is largely a subset of the woman's questionnaire. The woman's questionnaire contains a lot more information. Um, in particular, there are birth histories and key maternal and child health indicators. And here I was quite um, fascinated by the fact that the previous, in the previous session, people were talking about trying to get pregnancy histories on the phone, which I, I do believe from a lot of experience is going to be a very interesting um, experiment. From 2020 onwards, we too are collecting pregnancy histories. We've replaced the birth history with a pregnancy history. These are all the optional modules you find on in DHS, and the ones in red are largely uh, related to gender, you know, directly related to gender. Um, okay, so. Finally, um, one other key aspect of the DHS for those who don't know us very well is that there is a data archives. Every survey since 1984 has a microdata file with a standardized format, a format that we call recoded. Uh, the data are packaged in different ways. For example, a woman's file, a couple's file, children's file, et cetera, and are and all of these data sets are available in different formats um, for, download, for download free of charge. So this sort of completes the quick overview of the DHS. Um, and uh, let me now turn to the history and the specifics of the measurement of gender and women's empowerment in particular in the DHS program. This slide uh, is a bit of a walk down memory lane. I joined the DHS program in 93, 1993 as a gender analyst. At that time, a few gender and employment questions had already been introduced into the women's questionnaire. One of my first tasks was to analyze that data. Simultaneously, I was also tasked with developing a women's status module for the DHS, which was implemented subsequently in 1995 in Egypt. Based on this exercise, the DHS introduced many empowerment questions into the core questionnaires in 2000, 
and also developed optional modules on women's empowerment and domestic violence. Over time, we have continued to increase the number of gender-related questions in both the women's and the man's core questionnaires, and also increase the number of optional modules. So what indicators of gender and empowerment are currently available in the DHS? To better understand this question, a brief word about the conceptual model that underlies women's empowerment measure, measurement in the DHS. In designing questions to be included, we wanted to make sure that we were capturing not just what would count as evidence of empowerment, things like acts, attitudes or behaviors that reveal agency or active choice, but also capture the context that women live in. And by the way, that does include now cell phones, having them, owning them, having access to such information that they can provide. And to, and you know, these, the context can also create or it can detract from enabling such empowerment. On this slide, you see many familiar empowerment proxy indicators from education and employment to age at marriage and spousal age difference. You also see some variables which can provide a context for empowerment, including living in an educated household and being free from domestic violence. DHS also provides many variables that can be used as evidence of empowerment, including information on control over earnings, decision-making, having and using bank accounts, and being able to refuse a husband's sex, among other variables. Well, I hope I have whetted your appetite for DHS data in this whirlwind tour. The DHS gender data is used extensively for research by academics, if you search the publications database for the DHS website with the topic gender, you will find a list of hundreds of peer reviewed journal articles that have used the data. And this is only what we know about, uh, you know, the, the articles that we know about that people have either reported to us or a Google search has turned up. We also run a fellows program for faculty in DHS countries where we try to balance um, gender, you know, uh, participants by gender to the extent possible. We have a data users forum and work with local researchers to analyze the data for their own countries. In addition to, we have a research team devoted to analyzing DHS data to provide programmatic and policy relevant findings. Let me here share with you some highlights of illustrative gender research that we have done at the DHS over the years. I've selected three just to show the range of possibilities. The first one is this um, trends and inequalities and contextual determinants of child marriage in Asia done by my colleague, Kerry McQuarrie. Um, and the study examines the correlates of child marriage in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Indonesia and looks at geographical spread and clustering using interpolated spatial surfaces and also examines results of multivariate regressions with gender, wealth, and other explanatory variables. I'm not going to lay out what these studies found. This is really illustrative of the way the data can be used. The, this, next, uh, this slide, for example, shows the spread of child marriage across three, the three subcontinent countries. This is using the interpolated surfaces, using the GIS data linked with um, the data on, on um, lights over these areas. The DHS also provides a lot of covariates, geographical and weather covariates as part of the data sets. And all of these can then be used to develop these interpolated surfaces, which fill in the gaps um, for various variables um, you know, where we did not have a survey, where we, the, the areas that were not entirely sampled. This graph shows you the distribution of marriage by um, the wealth index. And you can see that because there are multiple surveys in countries over the years, you can actually also look at the trends by the different levels of wealth. Turning to another um, study, which is also by Kerry, 
uh, which looks at measuring empowerment among youths age 15 to 29. The objective here is to study the association between youth empowerment and fertility intentions. To measure empowerment among youth, the study did a factor analysis with all of these items, um, which give you a sense of the range of indicators that are available from DHS surveys for this sort of analysis. The factors, the factor analysis yielded six factors with attitude towards attitudes, women's attitudes towards acceptance of violence at the very top. And this graph shows the distribution of levels of youth empowerment divided into low, medium, and high across the 10 countries studied. And finally, here is an example of how the youth empowerment relates to health and other outcomes. And I selected just one outcome that they had studied, um, the case of contraceptive use and intentions to use contraception among those who are not currently using. And as you can see, you can look at variations here. My third research and last one is an example uh, of the analysis of the linkages between intimate partner violence um, or IPV and self-reported sexually transmitted infections for STI or STIs, which I conducted almost 10 years ago. In the study, I asked whether the expected positive STI IPV relationship could be generalized across cultures and whether IPV affects women's STI status independently of the husband's status. The study controlled for these variables most of which are seen as risk factors for having an STI. The key finding of this study was that among all the variables considered, recent IPV experience is most consistently and positively related to women's risk of STI in all of the six countries studied. So as you have seen, from the example provided, the DHS provides an inordinate amount of data that can be used to tap into the different dimensions of gender and women's empowerment. These data are in, in, in sorry, these data are in addition to all the inter information on a range of health and demographic variables. Nonetheless, there remain many critical gaps, not just in the data available but also in the conceptualization of gender measures, in particular of women's empowerment. With regard to the data not collected, I want to emphasize two long-standing gaps. First, we need more longitudinal data. While many surveys provide point or cross-sectional data, including the DHS, longitudinal studies are needed to monitor changes. And gen, uh, in gender and empowerment and to understand causality. And here I do believe that the digital, um, the use of telephones is going to really make a huge difference, making it cheaper to follow people to actually have, you know, uh, prevent dropout. The second issue is the fact that no matter how we capture the different dimensions of empowerment, their relevance and applicability vary across cultures and across the life course. For example, we really need to approach the measurement of empowerment differently for married and unmarried women in most of the contexts that we work in and for adolescents versus adults. Another related data gap is regarding interpreting the data we do collect without a qualitative component to quantitative assessments, it is difficult to decode answers to some of the questions we ask. I want to also make a few points regarding some continuing gaps in our understanding of empowerment and its various manifestations. The first concern is about the nature of interrelationships between the various variables used to capture empowerment. For example, how important are attitudes towards gender equality? To take the DHS questions, for example, on women's acceptance of the right of a husband to beat his wife. Conceptually speaking, does the fact that a woman justifies wife beating outweigh the importance of her participation in decisions, a key indicate, which is considered a key indicator of empowerment? 
or when, how much, and under what circumstances do education or, or employment relate to the evidence of empowerment? This dilemma does require us to begin to think outside the box about variables that could provide alternate measures of empowerment. One outside the box example is based on a paper that Al Kabasu and a co author wrote for DHS almost 20 years ago. They argued for leisure or self indulgence as empowerment because it shows self worth. True freedom, they said, requires some measure of self indulgence and the freedom to do relatively unproductive things. The late Harriet Presser also often emphasized some non-traditional indicators as potential measures of empowerment, including how many hours of sleep women get and how often women compared to men go hungry. These she felt were fundamental to women's status and ultimately to their ability to have choices and formulate and meet life goals. In summary, then, I have three points to make. The first is about choice. For empowerment, does the part chosen matter? I ponder this particularly in light of choices made not to contracept despite, say, unmet need, or a choice in favor of sex-selective abortion of a female fetus. Second, Evidence variables will differ by location, domain of study, and life stage, just to name a few. So how many dimensions are really needed and how many are needed to count a woman as empowered? Finally, is the really big question, what does success look like? Given how little we fully understand the multidimensionality of empowerment, and how it relates to the context in which it takes place, will we really know an empowered woman when we see one, particularly in unfamiliar cultural settings? And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation, Dr. Kishore, for talking us through the rich richness of DHS in many ways and what we can do with it, but also through its limitations, and I would say the art and the science of the DHS. Let me remind the audience, maybe at this stage, to please post their questions. If you have any, I already see some in the Q&A tab. I will also monitor the participant list if anyone wants to raise their hand to come in, and I will try to monitor the chat function at the same time. So if I look a bit confused at times, it's because I'm having my eyes on all of these things. Let me turn to the first question. And I think it is a question uh, for Professor Kashia. Here, a panelist or a, a attendee notes that it's understandable how the use of cell phones can increase our knowledge of contraceptive methods. But she wonders, or he wonders, I'm sorry, whether the use of cell phones can in fact help to increase acceptance and the use of contraceptive methods. So it's really two different things, right? We can use cell phones and it can help us be better informed about various contraception methods, but will it really make a difference in the use and uptake? And before we go there, the second question, let me just check whether it's also for you. I believe it is. Daniel Goodkind is wondering how digital connectivity is associated with greater contraceptive use. For example, general surfing and social connections or are women accessing specific public health websites? Do you know what they're looking for, what kind of content they're using, and how does it affect contraceptive use? Great, thank you very much yep. for these, these questions. Um, so I, I think sort of the, the, the broad way that I read both of these questions is a better understanding or a desire to understand the sort of mechanisms or pathways through which technology um, can affect the kinds of outcomes linked to uh, health well-being um, that I talked about. 
And I think, so, and, so I think sort of conceptually, I think that the kind of key mechanisms are linked to, um, you know, closing information gaps, better information and knowledge. Part of that is also because in a number of contexts, we see the implementation of a lot of sort of M health type interventions, mobile health interventions, where a lot of information, say SMS, SMSs is, uh, are the mechanisms to, or, the, or the vehicles for information about family planning being disseminated or um, other kinds of uh, health interventions might be, you know, predicated on, on mobile technology. So part of that is kind of information that can just sort of be general information, but also more targeted specific information that is provided by say, you know, some health provider, um, which might, you know, stop you from needing to go to a clinic or, or a health center in order to be able to access it. Um, there's that. There's also the other issue of sort of just better improved connectivity, not just with services or information providers, but also potentially better connectivity with friends and family um, and, and others, uh, you know, who you might say if you kind of married into a different or place very far away, um, and you kind of have a loss of your natal kin, it's an opportunity potentially to be able to reconnect with them more regularly than if you just completely moved away very far and had very little contact with them, right? So if we think of sort of one of the key underpinnings of in South Asia, the literature says that sort of patrilocal exogamy is a very key reason for why women are disempowered post-marriage, then maybe being able to talk to your parents repeatedly uh, with a mobile phone could be one mechanism that kind of over offsets some of that, uh, some of the, the kind of, the, you know, the change circumstances in the mar post-marriage in the life course of women. That could be one uh, other kind of mechanism. And a third thing could just be, um, you know, also just sort of expanded uh, networks and connectivity and also access to infrastructure such as mobile banking um, that mobile phones enable. Now, in relation to which of these is specifically operating, um, I think it's at the moment, you know, to some extent in the DHS, we had these questions on, you know, are you, do you know about uh, HIV or where to get an HIV test? And we have questions linked to information and knowledge. Um, and we found effects for those, which suggest that there's definitely a role for an informational improvement as a potential path pathway. The, the fact that information gaps are being closed as a potential pathway but I think there's much more work to be done to understand some of these mechanisms better. Another way that I've been using social media data to understand is to look at kind of differential interests. So what are the kinds of topics or, or groups that women are, you know, are, are actively involved in on Facebook um, as a way to try and understand also how, how online media are being used for different domains of life, uh, for different domains of life for women versus men, but also at different ages. Um, is one way to get at sort of interests and aspirations uh, in a world which is increasingly digitalized. So I think there are a number of different kinds of mechanisms and pathways. Some of these have been talked about in the broader literature on media effects as well, right? Like there are papers that talk about, you know, cable TV and its effect on, on fertility uh, or, or sun preference in the context of India. Um, so in a sense, some of these broader discussions around media fix already, already exist, but of course, if we think about the mobile phone as a technology, it's kind of different from a TV, right? It's more private, it potentially allows private conversations, um, it also allows access to, wider, to a wider world, especially if there's mobile internet involved. So I think there's kind of some of the same things as, as a cable television, but there's more to it when we think about mobile technologies uh, in particular. Yes, thank you very much. I would love to hear much more about the content. If you have any analysis of the content women are accessing versus men at some point, but let me turn to uh, Dr. Kishore. The second part of Daniel Goodkin's question, I think, relates to you. And he's wondering whether the TFR is related, associated, correlated with any of these out of the box measures of empowerment. And well, maybe that quiz question just quickly, I have another follow-up question for you, but maybe you'd answer this one just quickly. Yeah, this should be a short answer because we don't have data on these out of the box um, thinking that Alka or uh, Harriet Presser had, um, but you know, it's worth exploring. 
Thank you. That was a short answer. This morning, I moderated a session on family and fertility. I don't know whether you were in the audience then. And the, one of the presentations informed us that a number of DHSs undertaken in Latin America is going down. And a question to you would be, do you, do you have an explanation for this? Why are some countries or regions seemingly are doing fewer DHSs? Do they become less relevant? in a certain developmental context? Are they replaced by something else? Or what could explain this trend that we see? Um, for the last 10 years almost, I would say, or at least eight, nine years, we've really done no, so no DHSs, in, in, uh, not through the DHS program. There are some countries that do their own DHS. Uh, Bolivia, for example, does, their, does its own. Peru, for the longest time since, uh, maybe two, uh, 2010, 2009, had the continuous survey, uh, or even earlier actually, had the continuous survey, which we supported for five years. And um, now it does its own survey. Um, essentially, DHS is supported by USAID. It's a USAID, the US Agency of International Development project and countries in which USAID's presence or aid is less, are, and as countries sort of increase their capacity to do these surveys on their own or any surveys on their own, they're graduated out of the system. And almost all of Latin America, uh, you know, we do a little bit of assistance in Colombia, but they do their own uh, surveys. Now, one of the downsides very quickly of uh, countries graduating out is then, of course, you don't have standardization anymore because, you know, countries will choose what they want and uh, you will not get standard data across the world. So there is something to be said um, of trying to figure out a system by which there are some commonalities across surveys, irrespective of whether they're done under, under the DHS program per se or not. And this is, by the way, true of several. Turkey does its own, Sri Lanka does its own, um, many surveys that have either graduated or were never in the system anyway. Thank you so much. In your presentation, you also mentioned it would be great um, if you could have more information on gender empowerment issues, gender equality. Do you think that the GGS, and I don't know whether you're an expert in this, but I'm sure you're familiar with it, could substitute or could pro provide some of this information even in some of the poorer countries of the world. I'm asking you this, I, of course, I'm aware that Anne Gauthier and others are also here uh, participating in the meeting and maybe they have other views, but I would love to hear your views on this. Do you see a complementarity with the GGS? Do you see potential to go deeper with the GGS? I do think that there are, first of all, it's impossible for one survey program to cover the world, right? And then it shouldn't be, you know, we've got to share. Uh, I think there's a lot of innovation when we learn from each other and the GGS is making a lot of inroads. They are, you know, essentially, I, if we are talking about the same program, I do sit on the advisory board of, of that. Um, but um, so I do think there is complementarity and, but it is important, and this, this sort of goes back to the fact that say the SDGs, for example, are supposed to be for all countries, Europe, America, the developing world, et cetera. But the way, particularly gender issues, how we ask about them and what our objective is, is going to vary depending you know, to a great extent, depending uh, on, on which countries we, or which cultural context we are talking in. And this is where the point I was making that the DHS has to maintain a kind of standard approach. And so we sometimes have to go for the lowest common denominator in trying to understand what are the questions that have to be included in order to be able to standardize it across. And this is, you know, again, GDP, depending on what, what set of countries it's focusing on, would have to decide that. And it may not exactly coincide. DHS works only in low and middle income countries. We are not looking at the, at the higher income countries. So it's, it's interesting. I think there are 
a lot of opportunities. And frankly, over time, as you, you know, as donor funding is becoming more and more constrained, you may see less and less DHSs. So others are going to have to step in. Thank you so much. I'm aware we are already two minutes over time. But Professor Kashyap, the last question to you. You know, you mentioned that the use of cell phone data is positively associated, correlated, maybe even indeed, with uh, the family plan, the use of family planning methods, and so on and so forth. Have you controlled for education, income, when you did this analysis, for just to name a few things, or is the only factor that you looked at the digital infrastructure and try to control for that, if I understood you correctly? And maybe lastly, should we distribute cell phones together with condoms? Or what's the recommendation? Um, yeah, so all the analyses that I presented, they control both the macro level as well as the micro level analyses that I presented. They all controlled for sort of education, wealth, or economic development. Um, and these effects of mobile phones come through despite that. And they're also robust to the use of the in instrumental variable that I was talking about. Um, that's why sort of they're kind of striking, I guess. Um, but um, <laughs> should we just, I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's complementarity potentially in, in sort of, you know, in, in thinking of mobile phones as a kind of a bright, as a, you know, mobile phones are some things that sort of diffusing naturally anyway, through kind of, you know, they're becoming cheaper, more accessible. I guess my point here was more that, you know, that there seem to be these big payoffs, especially when they're in the hands of women, but we also see at the same time these kind of gender gaps, and we need to understand gender gaps as well. To some extent, the digital age has the potential to overcome some of the, uh, you know, challenges uh, uh, that people in sort of, you know, less developed areas or with, with otherwise lacking infrastructure uh, face, and they can accelerate overcoming some of those obstacles. But that doesn't mean that, you know, that requires us also to think more critically about digital divides when we are thinking about sort of a broader development agenda. This is not something that will automatically solve itself. So I guess my point is that, you know, both of these things need to go hand in hand um, and everything needs to work to complement um, uh, each other. Thank you so much. I, I promised. Yeah, yeah. Can I just Excuse say one? Absolutely. Come in. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. I know we're over time, but I just wanted to say that it's, it, you know, it's so exciting to think about mobile technology and what it can do. But we've also got to think simultaneously about how women's access to this technology, I mean, that itself becomes a study. Is yeah. we are exactly. imposing this new technology on top of existing exactly. relations. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and like when, when in Bangladesh, when they had the experiment with, with, you know, all the credit stuff, one of the things was that a lot of women experience a lot of increased violence because it, you're, you're introducing a new technology or a new way of doing things on an existing gender yeah. uh, platform. And, yeah. and, you know, to what extent are cell phones and mobile phones changing that? And are they reinforcing that? Um, yeah. Or, yeah. And, and or, are we, yeah. So I think that itself is a fascinating study. Absolutely. It take up time, but I did want to put that in. Yeah. It, I don't want to let you go because now we're having a good conversation. I, I yeah. promised it was the last con last question, but it's not. Georges Renier has another one for you. Yeah. And he's wondering whether greater access to uh, information and communication tech will also, of course, help men to have access to a greater diversity of information. And in some cases, information that's maybe not as tightly controlled by the government. Does, do we have any evidence that this makes a difference yeah? Uh, yeah. In, I, in, I, in any direction, really, plus or minus? Yeah, yeah I think- We have a I greater think... diversity of information that's not controlled. Does, does it make a difference? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, so just kind of to connect some of the points that Dr. Kishore was just making, I think one of the sort of interesting things is that we are now at this stage where we clearly recognize that 
digital technologies matter. And now we see that their views and the questions about them are being incorporated in survey infrastructures such as the DHS, which I really think is excellent and exciting, which also allows us to see how they interrelate, how online and offline inequalities interrelate in a way that we couldn't do before, right? And, and that's why in the past you only did social media studies, but you didn't do anything else. And now we're in a position where we can potentially think of them together. Um, but that also means that we still are, but we still have a very sort of crude set of measures of digital technology use uh, in, in the survey data sets, all the kinds of infrastructures that, you know, that demographers and other social scientists use. We still don't, for example, understand, you know, we don't have any question the DHS of social media use at the moment. Um, we don't have questions about, for example, you know, what are the kinds of access to information sources? Are you visiting public health sites? To, to be able to better understand those kinds of mechanisms at scale. Uh, so we can understand them by looking, for example, on social media and seeing, okay, what pages are liked or not. But, you know, we ideally like to do it in a way where some of these deeper measures of digital engagement are embedded within high quality survey infrastructures. So we can speak to some of these questions of how online offline worlds interrelate because they clearly do. Um, and I guess that's my point that digital gender inequalities isn't something for media studies anymore. It's something that demographers and social scientists need to critically think about and engage with because they have impacts on the outcomes and processes that we've been studying for so long. Um, and I guess that's why, you know, this is, this is it's really important to, to enmesh these two kinds of, uh, these kinds of different data sources to, to get at these questions. Um, just to George's point, I, we're working on a separate project where we're actually looking at the effects of males versus female access to mobile phones and impacts on gender attitudes using the Afrobarometer, again, where we're trying to use an IV, where we are looking at mobile coverage uh, through some geographical data sets. And we're actually finding, interestingly, mobile ownership has impacts on women, but it doesn't have any, any positive impacts on men. Um, so, you know, we're sort of still trying to make sense of that. Uh, the fact that we see technology impacts for women, but nothing, you know, no sort of positive impacts on, on improved, uh, more egalitarian attitudes for men. Um, so, you know, that's also an, another reason to sort of understand the differential role of technology for different groups. Richie, thank you so much for your presentation and this engaging conversation. So, Nita, do you want to make a last comment, last point? Otherwise, I would be closing the session. No, I, I think this has been very fascinating. Sometimes, yeah. of course, the discussion is, is, is the key part. So, and that's exactly what's happened. Thank you so much for, uh, for this session. Well, thanks to both of you really very, very much. And I will now hand over to Nico van Nimmegen to close the Berlin Demography Days, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, Nico, I don't know whether you will give me the floor again, but uh, as UNFPA is a partner of these events, let me just say it was a great pleasure to co-organize this, to partner with Population Europe, you know, and also from UNFPA side. A great thanks to Andreas and Daniela for all their hard work behind this. It was a pleasure to be part of it. We're looking forward to next year's and hopefully in person. Thank you very much. Nico. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for, for these words. And of course, I would have given you the floor because uh, someone wrote on the program conclusion and then uh, somebody like Andreas Edel asked me, hey, Nico, can you do that? And of course, I will try to uh, do this impossible task, uh, but I will not go very deep into the uh, substantive uh, conclusions of this, this meeting. Just to say that we had great sessions today. We have a, a very rich harvest of ideas. And this uh, led me to my first conclusion, this type of conversations that we are having had this, uh, this day, uh, they need to be continued. And uh, we need to, uh, to shine a, a wider light on, on, on data needs. And uh, we, we did some, uh, some, some great sessions today. So it needs to be continued. We had the spotlight on data, uh, the lifeblood of all science, also population science, I said in my introduction uh, this morning. We're also looking at the, the policy implications, all in the field of, of evidence-informed policy making. Well, for good evidence, of course, data are, are crucial. So data and also methods are, are, are very important tools. And uh, the IUSSP is, is, is paying a lot of attention to, to data and data for development. 
and we were very happy that in this uh, regard we were able to to help organize this uh, this session and we, we really um, enjoyed it so coming back to to some of the of the conclusions that uh, some general points that, that could be drawn we heard that all data have imperfections all sources uh, have some some limitations and 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 one way forward is to to combine more sources to 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 deal with these imperfections and complementarity is 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 a key word there and i think that's uh, that's that's the way uh, forward that we that we need to go in this uh, context somebody uh, used the word uh, data amalgamation and i think that's also a very challenging uh, field that we need to, uh, to to develop further in addition to in fact having more disciplines uh, working on the same topic also need the amalgamation of, of, of data sources uh, general conclusions also say that if you look at uh, the indicators uh, we still need more and better policy indicators we had uh, discussions on the, the demographic dividend in africa on population projections in africa impacts on on the the well-being of of, of, of uh, women in in africa impacts of the, the well-being on the elderly in india it's all about indicators good indicators and follow-up studies also that's also one of the conclusions that uh, longitudinal uh, data are, are a very important source for latin america it was said that also uh, in addition to the census and, and, and the other uh, surveys that we have there like the dhs also retrospective surveys could be a, a good a good source an additional data source to uh, to be to be used we discussed uh, a lot in, in most of the topics like digital trace data mobile data the, the social media is a very important additional source which can complement uh, the, the analysis that we are doing as uh, as population scientists and i think that uh, we are making uh, progress there it's it's still uh, a field that's 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 in the beginning of uh, of its development but i think it's it's uh, it's a very promising field to to further develop and in the iussp we have our our scientific panel on, on digital demography and uh, some of the colleagues that are here today are part of that uh, that scientific panel and it's really a very exciting uh, exciting field uh, just looking at at some of my other uh, notes maybe i'm not doing justice to uh, to everything that uh, that was, was said before i think i would like to leave it at this but coming back to my first conclusion that this conversation needs to be continued I would like to link it up with the International Population Conference uh, that the IOSSP, together with Indian colleagues and other partners, is uh, organizing. And this will take place from the 5th till the 10th of December this year. It originally was planned to, be, uh, to take place to convene in Hyderabad, India. Unfortunately, we will only have a, a small on site uh, presence in India still in a hybrid uh, version. But most of that conference will be virtual. And I hope and I expect that a lot of the conversations that we have started today will be uh, continued during that conference. And I would like to, to end that as IUSSP, we were very happy to collaborate with uh, our, our good friends of Population Europe, Andreas Edel and his team have done a fantastic job. And also the other sponsors of, uh, of, of this, uh, this global uh, demography forum. Uh, we are very grateful that we were part of this, uh, this great route. And, we are, are, I'm thanking you from the bottom of my heart very much for everything that I've learned today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Nico, for this very uh, great conclusions. And uh, of course, you, it's really hard to conclude such a, a rich conference, but uh, uh, still very, very much. So thank you to, also to your nice remarks and also to, to Michael. Uh, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's it's now time for closing remarks. Um, let me first thank you all for joining us today and uh, for contributing to the debate, uh, which with your thoughtful questions and comments today and also during the other Berlin Demography Days. Uh, this day was particularly rich and insightful. We learned a lot about the various perspectives uh, demography can offer at the, from the national to the European and the global scale. Furthermore, what tremendous innovative capacity this research uh, uh, has, which, which always keeps up with most sophisticated data methods and uh, most recent technologies. 
Thanks a lot to our presenters uh, and moderators today who shared with us the results of their innovative research and showed us so many perspectives for future research to get done, uh, future policy issues uh, to get settled and future data sources to get explored. So I would like to, to emphatically uh, thank our colleagues, Albert Esteve, Alex Eze, Elia Zulu, Emilio Zagheni, Georges Renier, James Couriot, Rainer Münz, Riri Kashab, Samuel Clark, Sunita Kishore, and Wolfgang Lutz. Just the <laughs> enlisting of the names shows you how rich this conference today has been. Furthermore, I would like to thank our moderators, uh, Daniela Fono, uh, Nico van Nimbechen, and Michael Herman, that they guided us so excellently uh, through the day. I would also like to thank, also on behalf of the Diakonie Deutschland, uh, with whom we are co-organizers of the Berlin Demography Days, the partners of the Berlin Demography Forum, uh, the European Association for Population Studies, the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, IUSSP, uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and the United Nations Population Fund. Particularly, I would like to thank the German government, represented by the Federal Ministry for Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth, and the Federal Ministry of Health, who are financially supporting this event, as well as to the Förderfonds Wissenschaft in Berlin, the donor of the European Demographer Awards, which have been uh, um, given in the first day of the Berlin Demography Days. We plan to publish the streaming online at Population Europe's YouTube channel and will provide you the information as soon as this post-production has been done. Uh, with this announcement, I would like to close the 2021 Global Demography Forum. Thanks a lot for your participation. Hope to see you at the next Berlin Demography Days again. Take care, stay healthy, Goodbye and thanks a lot for joining us today. Bye-bye.